Oh, hypocrisy, beautiful, beautiful hypocrisy. How are you, Cider Crusaders? America's the greatest country in the world. Thanks for being here. Have you been following the New York City mayor's race? I have not because I don't care. I'm in San Diego. I couldn't be physically further away. But we have to start following it now because it just got very interesting. I'll start with the true story, bottom line. I'll say the exact same thing that we said uh, right before the 2020 presidential election and right after it. Truism number one. If something can be rigged, it will be rigged. Especially something with such high stakes as a presidential election. Especially something with not only high stakes, but the left was saying that Trump was Hitler. He must be stopped. If something can be rigged, it will. Second point, along with outright corruption, people are so inept. Just total idiots, especially people on bureaucratic election boards. And I'll get to that in, in just a minute. I'll get back to that one. So here's what happened. New York City, the mayor's race primary, is ranked choice voting. And this is the first time they've ever done this, ranked choice. So you go to vote. You have all the candidates there. You mark your first choice, then your second choice, then your third choice, and you go all the way down. If the first place person, they count, they count everybody's first, first choice. If that first place person does not get 50% of the vote, or should, I should say if they do get 50%, boom, it's over, they win. If they don't, then they take out the lowest ranked candidate and they take all of those voters second place, second choice, and allocate them again. Okay, well that person still didn't get to 50, 50%. Okay, so then we take out the next lowest person and we find all their second or even third choice uh, on their ballots, and then they reallocate the votes again. And they keep doing that, keep getting rid of the lowest vote, get her lowest vote, until someone gets 50% of the vote. So they did this in New York City. After 10 rounds of recalculating the votes, after 10 rounds, the guy who was in first started to notice something a little weird. And we have his statement here, which I did not have pulled up, but we have it up on the screen. He said, uh, Sorry, lo siento, lo siento. He said, the vote total just released by the Board of Elections is 100,000 plus more than the total announced on election night, raising serious questions, you think? Now, my first statement is, how dare he question the integrity of election results? Oh, he's undermining democracy in the nation's biggest city. How dare he? He's Hitler. He's evil. He's a Nazi. He's the worst. Keep in mind, this is the same man who back in November, he said of Trump, if you believe in our democracy and in the peaceful transition of power, then you have an obligation to speak out against Donald Trump's dangerous, unsubstantiated claims of voter fraud. Now, back to Eric Allen today. Turns out, he was right. The inept idiots at the Board of Election, they counted 135,000 practice ballots, fake ballot, like, like it's their own. I don't even know like what the deal with these are, but they're like fake test ballots that they, I don't even know what, like used before the election to practice the tabulations or something and they just redid it again. It took 10 times, right? 10 recountings before Eric Adams' campaign said, wait a second, that doesn't seem right. Again, if Donald Trump dared to question any vote tabulations in his election, then he's destroying democracy, a tyrant, a dictator, the most evil man in the world, except for Ron DeSantis, of course. But in New York City, they counted 135,000 fake ballots. Just for a little perspective, I think Eric Allen has something like 270,000 votes. He was up by, 200, two, what was it? Do you have it? I think, he, Eric Adams, I'm sorry, Eric Adams. Um, I think he had 270,000 votes, so he was up by 60,000, and he now he's up by 16,000. So 135,000 fake ballots will definitely make a difference in the outcome. Now, is that corrupt or is it inept? Don't know. But this is the New York Times last October 
Okay, so just, what, seven, eight months ago? Here's the New York Times. They said, inside decades of nepotism and bungling at the New York City elections board. <laughs> so everyone saw this coming, just like everyone saw voter fraud coming in the 2020 election. We played on this very show a PBS NewsHour special about how easy it is to hack into Dominion voting machines in Georgia. That was a PBS NewsHour special in October, right before the 2020 election, getting ready for Trump to win, and then they can come back and claim voter fraud. And here's the same thing. Same thing. Everyone knew this was coming and did nothing about it. Maybe I shouldn't say all this. Maybe I should. Let me uh, let me make it. Let me be very clear uh, for the screeners, the censors on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. There is no way, no way, that the election results of the 2020 presidential election, where Donald Trump lost Arizona by 10,000 and Wisconsin by 20,000, there's no way there was any corruption or ineptness there. Not a chance. No way. No how. Was that good? Is YouTube gonna accept that? I think they believe that. But in this New York City Democratic primary, well, there was. We have a Trump statement here uh, as well. We'll throw up on the screen. It's basically a big, uh, told you so. <laughs> I love that. What are people complaining about? <laughs> oh, good times. All right, switching gears. We got to talk about the Delta variant of COVID. Ooh, the Delta variant. Everyone freak out. It's the Delta variant. You've heard that the Delta variant, well, if you listen to the lame stream, which I hope you don't anymore. I've had enough panic mongering from them for a year and a half. But if you have happened to tune into it by accident, the Delta variant is more infectious. It's more dangerous. It affects younger and younger people. Fauci said, uh, the, well, this is, so this is Joe Biden uh, tweeting a video of Fauci. The Delta variant is more contagious. It's deadlier. It's spreading quickly around the world, leaving young, unvaccinated people more vulnerable than ever. Please get vaccinated if you haven't already. Let's head off this strain before it's too late. There is no reason to believe at all, no reason whatsoever to believe that anything that Fauci just said there is true. So far, everything we know, the Delta variant has no distinguishing difference between any of the other variants of COVID. No difference if you're vaccinated, no difference if you're not vaccinated. It all comes, so there's no, I just wanna be very clear about it. No difference. Everyone's fear mongering about how it's different not different. I don't know how many more times we have to do this before you stop believing these people. It all comes back to this distinction that for some reason people are unable to make between infected and sick. When you get vaccinated, you can still be infected, but you're not going to get sick. So there's a story the other day of a cruise line, a cruise ship, right? There's more cruises out there now. And they did some routine testing and they got back uh, four infections or four people who were infected with COVID. And it turns out three of them were vaccinated. Oh no, the vaccines don't work. That's, the, that's what the headlines and the articles implies that the vaccines don't work. Look, they were uh, vaccinated and they still got infected. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. But did they get sick? No, they didn't get sick which means the vaccine worked. You can still get infected, but you won't get sick. So when you hear stories about people getting infected with COVID, do not conclude that that means the vaccines don't work and the new Delta variant can get around the vaccine. Not what it means. The vaccine works. And it works on the Delta variant just the same as it's been working. This hysteria, I hope all that's super clear. This hysteria is so out of control, LA County, Yesterday has a new mask mandate, or re-upping re re the mask mandate again. Now even inside, vaccinated or not, you have to wear masks again in LA County. That is absolute insanity. Now, you're asking, well, how, Slater, how come the Delta variant is now the most prevalent of the strains? So the technical word for this is 
fit. The virus is more fit. It's not more infectious. It doesn't spread faster. It doesn't spread harder. Remember we played a clip of um, the head of uh, Biden's COVID task force. He was on like CBS News or something. And we played a clip of him saying, with the old COVID, you could be in a room for 10 minutes before you get infected. And now you only have to be in there for five minutes before the Delta variant will get you. And we played that for Professor Rack and Yellow, a virologist from Columbia. And he said, oh, what a bunch of baloney. <laughs> what an absolute bunch of baloney. He says the virus is more fit, but it doesn't mean it's any more dangerous. So here's how I like to visualize it. I got two metaphors for you. You ready for this? We got time? Let's do this. Two metaphors. When a virus is more fit, it means it crowds out the other strains of the virus. Okay? It means it takes out the other strains of the virus and gains supremacy among the virus. So visualize it like this. Uh, we've seen these videos. I'm sure you've seen these videos of uh, like canine police officer dog training videos, right? Like this one right here. And that guy's wearing this suit, right? This like Michelin man protective suit, okay? In my metaphor, that is vaccinated. You are vaccinated, okay? That canine, that, that uh, German shepherd's gonna come after you and you're totally protected. The dog in this case, of course, is COVID. You with me? Now, imagine you go to a dog park and you have to walk through a big field full of chihuahuas. There you go. Full of chihuahuas. Can you make it through this field? Will you survive? Yes, you will survive. You have a 0.0000% chance of getting seriously injured. And it even, look at that. You think that thing's gonna hurt you? You got a 0000% chance of dying from a chihuahua attack, especially if you're wearing that protective suit that protects against uh, German shepherds. Okay, so you'll be fine. Go ahead, walk around the park, you're okay. You don't even need to wear the suit. You're fine. The chihuahuas are not going to get you, okay? So you walk around the park. The next day, you come back, and there's no more chihuahuas. Now, the park is full of a brand new Pomeranian variant. Oh, my, this, the new Pomeranian variant. Oh, no! What happened to the old chihuahua variant? Now we have the more dangerous Pomeranian variant. What does that mean? It means the Pomeranians may be more fit among the dogs in the park. They've taken over the park. The Pomeranians have taken over, but a Pomeranian is no more dangerous to you than the Chihuahua. You with me? No one who's vaccinated against Chihuahua attacks now has to fear Pomeranian attacks. Maybe Chihuahuas have to fear Pomeranians, but you, human being, vaccinated or un, does not need to fear Pomeranians any more than you do Chihuahuas. Are we good? Does that make sense? The Pomeranians are more fit. They've taken over the park. The Delta variant's more fit. It's taken over the variants. But it is not more dangerous to you. Cool. All right, I got another analogy. Let's say you're at war. Right? You're at war. And someone's shooting at you. And you can visualize this any way you want. It could be like in a foxhole. Or it could be like a domestic battle, maybe. All right, I don't know. Wherever you are. And someone's shooting at you with 9 millimeter rounds. Okay, just go with it. Shooting at you with nine millimeter rounds. Uh, and they, uh, they run out. But then, and you think you're safe. Okay. But then, they get a new shipment of ammo. And people start freaking out. Because these new bullets, these new ammo, this new shipment of ammo that's coming at you, this is the brand new Winchester variant of nine millimeter rounds. Right, this is the Winchester variant of nine millimeter rounds. And someone's gonna be like, you're freaking out. You're like, oh no, it's the Winchester variant, the Winchester variant. And they're saying, oh, well, what were they shooting at you before? The Remington variant? Yeah, they're the exact same thing. Oh no, now it's the Winchester variant. It's way worse, it's worse. No, it's the same. I think we have a side by side of the two variants of nine millimeter rounds. There they are. They're both nine millimeter rounds. There's may, maybe there's a de I don't like if you dive deep into the intermakings of each of these rounds, maybe you can tell if you're a super duper expert of 
you can be like, oh, this has a different particle of gunpowder. I don't know. There's, in the end, a nine millimeter round is a nine millimeter round. In the end, COVID is COVID. Doesn't matter what variant you're talking about. Are you with me on the analogy? Now, if you're, I guess the vaccinated analogy here would be if you're, you're in a tank and someone's shooting nine millimeter rounds at you. It doesn't matter. If they come at you with a bazooka, okay, well now we can talk, okay? If the new variant of attack against you is a bazooka, well now we got a problem. But if it's still shooting nine millimeter rounds, it doesn't matter. And I guess to go back to the last analogy, if the new variant in the dog park, uh, instead of going from chihuahuas to Pomeranians, if the new variant are bears, then I, I'll, I would like to hear from Dr. Fauci. I should never, never hear from him again, but I, I, would, I would understand. Be like, hey everyone, there's now bears at the dog park. Your suit, your protective suit may not work against the bears. You with me? Your, your tank, it works against nine millimeter rounds, may not work against bazookas. Oh, but will it work against a Winchester nine millimeter? Yes, it'll work against Winchester nine millimeters. Just, you with me? Don't be worried about the Delta variant. If you're vaccinated, you're fine. And if you're not vaccinated, your risk is the same as it was before. Delta variant, beta variant, alpha variant, whatever. It's all the same. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word. Uh, we got uh, breaking news now. This is from uh, the Secretary of State Blinken, because there's nothing else going on in the world. Uh, for passports, you will no longer need to prove with medical documentation whether you're a male or a female. Uh, they'll just take whatever you list. And their goal is to uh, for equality of all LGBTQI plus persons. Their goal is to have... Um, X. You just put X. So you could be male, female, or X on your passport. <laughs> okay. Do you feel like you're the only one going crazy? Like, wh like, what is this admission from the federal government that there's more than two genders? Like, that's insane. That's absolutely insane. And sometimes I feel like I'm the only one going crazy. We talked yesterday about the NFL with their new ad saying football is gay and football's lesbian and football's queer. And it's like, what do we want? And people just keep giving them their money. <laughs> like, what if football is gay? What? A man won the Miss Nevada competition. Um, the first male to win the crown of Miss Nevada, and when he won the uh, he won the previous competition to like get up to the state finals, and he said, uh, "Miss Silver State was a great experience. To me, it was honestly a celebration of womanhood and diversity, and this celebration of being your true self. Celebration of womanhood. To have a man with the beauty pageant." Is there anything more patriarchal than that? Like seriously, like, that is the patriarchy. Men won't even let women win beauty pageants anymore. Men have to take over everything and then rub it in your face by saying, me, a man winning a beauty pageant is celebrating womanhood. Why are women okay with this? The most offensive and absurd of them all is the idea that men give birth. This is the cover of Practicing Midwife Magazine. Sorry, I... Uh, Take it off. Take it off. Take I saw it so you have to, okay? That was enough, and that will haunt you. That was a woman with a beard giving birth, but it's like a, he's like a, she's a man now. And the whole idea is here that men give birth, and that's where we are as a country. And that's why I feel like I'm going crazy, <laughs> because everyone seems to be going along with this. Why? Why do people go along with this nonsense? And it's only getting worse, and it's only going to get more serious. I have two stories I want to share here. The first, uh, they both have to deal with honor. 
The first is uh, a man with no honor, and the second is a story of a man with honor, and you decide which man you want to be. The first story is out of the Gulag Archipelago from uh, Soltanitskin. Uh, he was in a death camp where inmates survived six months on average. And one day the guards told them that a very important American journalist is going to come visit. Now, of course, the Soviets would only let in journalists who were communist sympathizers, right? And if you're one of these journalists and you want to advance in your career, you know you, you must say good things about the communists in the Soviet Union. You can't go and then write negative things. You're never going to be invited back, and then your whole career is over. So there's a very strong incentive for these journalists to say whatever the communists want them to say, which is true today, too, in China as well. So uh, these prison guards told the prisoners to behave, put, be on your best behavior when the American journalist comes. So the prisoners were taken to a place outside of the prison camp, obviously, and the journalists interviewed them. First, the journalists interviewed the guards, and the guards told them how wonderful the Soviet prison system is. And it's, they're so kind and uh, compassionate. And then, and the guy's just eating it up, like, oh. It's so wonderful to hear, so wonderful. And then the prisoners come out. And the American journalist says, is it true that you're treated very nicely here? And there's a guard standing, I'm the prisoner, there's a guard standing right behind, right behind him. And the prisoner's like, yes, mm -hmm. it's true. So Sultaniskin, he saw this whole charade. And obviously they were brought back to the prison camp and he thought, there's no way that journalist could possibly be stupid enough to believe it. There's no way. He must have enough honor to tell the truth. But a couple years later, he read that article, and yeah, that journalist accepted all of that, hook, line, and sinker. Wrote a very passionate article about how the Russian prison system is so much more humane than the one in America at a death camp that had an average of six months survival. Amazing. So did that guy believe the lies that he was told? Or did he just do it to get ahead in his own career? I don't know. Either way, no honor. There's a great line from Thomas Sowell. He said, many on the political left are so entranced by the beauty of their vision that they cannot see the ugly reality they're creating in the real world. The beauty of their vision. And that reminds me of the quote we shared last week, Washington Post article from 1994. And again, they're talking about how we don't even know how many people Chairman Mao killed in China. We don't even know. It could be 30 million, it could be 50 million, it could be 80 million. We don't even know. And uh, this author, she said, in the early years under Mao, many Western scholars were so enamored with Mao and communism that they refused to believe that such widespread atrocities could have been carried out by the Chinese communists. They were so enamored with Mao. They're so enamored with, as Thomas Sowell said, their vision. They refused to see the reality on the ground. They refused to believe that it could be true. And they lied to themselves. They had, they, they had such, such little honor that they could lie to themselves and say, no, this, this prisoner is definitely telling the truth about their time in this death camp, for example. What we need in this country is honor. Got a little story here about that. There's a book called, uh, this is the good story. This is the story of a man having honor. It's from the book Imperial Twilight, The Opium War and the End of China's Last Golden Age. So here's the story. Uh, it's uh, 1792. Lord McCartney, all right, British guy, Lord McCartney. He was the first ambassador to China. Okay, so put yourself there. 1792, this British guy, first ambassador to China. There he is, looking dapper. The British wanted more trade with China. Right? So they leave England in September 1792. They get to China August of 1793. Took them a year. Could you imagine? So the British arrive and they have all this pomp and circumstance. They have this whole big hullabaloo of, uh, to make a big you know, first impression, how great they are and how many gifts they have. And there's all these people and it's this big whole thing. And they go to meet with the emperor of China. His name was Quian Long. And here's he, looking, uh, looking dapper as well. Now here's the problem. <clears throat> to see that guy, to see the emperor of China, you had to first kowtow. 
kowtow is a real word. I didn't know this, right? But we've heard it before. Oh, are you gonna, you, are you gonna kowtow to the boss or whatever? It, it means something. It literally means head and touch. Kowtow means head, touch. So in order to see the emperor, you first had to kneel three times. So you had to get on your knees and then bow down three times. And then you had to kowtow nine times, which means you would lie on your stomach and then have your head touch the floor. Nine prostrations, okay? So to see the emperor, you had to do three kneeling bows and then nine kowtows. Nine, I'm not kidding. So this, the, the guy, the British guy, he said, no. <laughs> That's not happening. And they said, well, you have to. You have to see the emperor. You have to kowtow. He said, no, I'm not kowtowing to anybody. I'll kneel out of respect. How about that? I'll kneel. And they're like, no, you have to kowtow. Your head has to touch the ground. Nine, you have to lay on the ground nine times. Like, That's not happening. So the guy, the British guy said, okay, here's what I'll do. Here's what I'll do. I'll kowtow. I'll do it. If one of the Chinese higher ups does the same thing in front of a portrait of King George III. We got a portrait of King George III. We'll hang it up here. I'll do my kowtows to the emperor. You do your kowtows to the king, and we'll call it even. And the Chinese emperor said, no way, because I am the son of heaven among no equals, and I have no equals among me. And, and also the British, the Chinese, the emperor, he didn't consider that the British were giving them gifts. He saw it as the British bringing them tribute, right? The Chinese were due these items. He had no equal among anyone else in the world. So the Chinese emperor said, uh, okay, here's what we'll do. One prostrate. This is my favorite part of the story. One. That's all you got to do. Just the one. Not nine. You don't have to do nine. Just one. Isn't that a perfect metaphor for today? It's like, oh, you don't have to believe all these things. All you have to do is say that a, a boy can be a girl. It's just one. Oh, it's just one. You just got to say, uh, you just got to call this man uh, a woman. You just, all, listen, we're not asking you for a lot, okay? You don't have to do nine prostrations. All you have to do is say congratulations to that uh, beauty queen and tell her she's beautiful. And congratulations on winning the Miss Nevada pageant. That's it. It's just one prostration, not nine. So what did the guy do? He said, go pound sand. And that was the end of that. The whole trade thing was off. <laughs> there was a thing called honor. Now, there's two quotes I want to share. Uh, first, from the, They're both from Jonah Goldberg. This first one has to deal with China. Uh, he said, America should have some notion of honor. We don't have a crown, but we do have certain ideas and ideals that we would like to claim similar, like to claim similar loyalty to. We also like to claim that these ideals and ideas and ideals are universal. When we figuratively kowtow to China, we are openly admitting to China that both claims are untrue. You can't claim to believe human rights are universal while simultaneously excusing or ignoring the mass violation of human rights that defies China, defines China under communist rule. We in America kowtow to China. We do all nine prostrations and we throw in another one for good measure. That's what we're doing to China right now. We are kowtowing to them. Now, before I read the second quote, this isn't just America versus China as you read this, but also think of conservatives versus the cultural left, the woke cultural left. The people who have men win beauty pageants and say men can give birth and tell you to your face that the NFL is gay. Think about the woke left as well. Here's Jonah Goldberg. He said, it's not like the... Chinese and also woke left respect us for our groveling. They, the woke left, enjoy watching us bend to their demands and they mock our obsequious desire to gain favor as proof of their superior system. They use our self-flagellation over race as a cudgel in their propaganda. Such appeasement only buys greater demands and worse moral and strategic compromise. Be like Lord McCartney. Do not kowtow 
to the communists or the woke left here at home. They're the same, same, same thing anyway. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Slater Crusaders, we need to fight critical race theory every single way possible. And one of the ways that we need to do it is in the courts. And I'm grateful. I think this is the first case I've heard of, of this actually making it to the courts. Uh, the general counsel for uh, the Southeastern Legal Foundation is here with a case out of uh, Indiana. Is that right? Indiana? Kimberly Herman is here. Uh, Kimberly, how are you today? Is it Illinois I'm good. or Indiana? We have sued against uh, Evanston, Illinois, actually. Illinois. Okay, yeah. what's going on here? What are they doing there? Yeah, so for years, actually, since about 2015, uh, the school district in Evanston, Illinois, has been discriminating against its teachers and its students on the basis of race. It is segregating them um, in teacher trainings. It is segregating them in the classroom. It has basically taken the idea of equity and critical race theory and implemented it into every single lesson, in every single class, in every single grade. And we have sued on behalf of a teacher to get them to stop doing this. Love it. Uh, what, now we know all the problems with this, right? Socially, morally, the whole thing. What's the legal problem? What, what law is this breaking? Yeah, so what people forget a lot of times is that our schools are arms of the government. And because they are arms of the government, they cannot discriminate on, against people because of their race, right? They cannot treat people differently because of their skin color. This is what we call equality, and it is enshrined in the 14th Amendment of our Constitution. People frequently confuse it with the idea of equity, which is what District 65 has declared is its ultimate mission. And equity in this context is really a license to punish Americans because of their skin color. Um, it is unconstitutional. It, it violates the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And we are looking forward to the court declaring that in our case. No, and I, I hope they will, certainly. I, you would think they would. How would they Yeah, not? we expect what, them what to. Would be the <laughs> yeah, what, what would be the argument against this? Legal. Uh, to, to be honest, um, it's going to be a tough case for them. We already have a letter of finding from the Department of Education where they investigated discrimination in Evanston and they found that District 65 violated the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, days after President Biden was inaugurated, the Department of Education rescinded that letter for reasons that have yet to be explained. And so we have good legal ground to stand on here, and they're gonna have an uphill battle to show that they are not discriminating when they're placing people in different rooms because of their race. I mean, it's like we're going back to the yeah. 1950s in Evanston. Totally. How does affirmative action play into this, right? If you can't discriminate, you can't treat people differently, but affirmative action does. So how is that, how is this different? Yeah, well, in affirmative action, we're looking at an entirely different kind of uh, legal framework, right? Where there may have been discrimination in the past that they are trying to overcome very specific acts of discrimination. That's not what's going on in the district here. This is what we see happening across the country where in the curriculum, they are teaching the non-white students to hate and they are teaching the white students to hate themselves. And it is now, unconstitutional. So they would say, I'm just a devil's advocate, they would say, uh, and I'm totally with you, obviously, they would say, um, well, that's not what's happening. And we've had uh, previous discrimination in our schools and the way there's just systemic racism in our schools. So we really need to isolate that and find equity uh, by, uh, what do they say? Like, like uh, uh, more equitable teaching practices and lived experiences and, and we're separating uh, although equal, <laughs> we're separating so that everybody can be open and honest and come together in a more equitable and, and uh, uh, cohesive way is all. <laughs> what that, or whatever yeah, well, nonsense I mean, they'll come up with. No, I'm with you. When, when there's disparities that you see in test scores and things like that, if they have that, there are constitutional and legal ways to address that. There are great curriculum uh, programs out there. It is not the race-based programming that we are seeing. 
everything that we are seeing in District 65 is sending their education and sending their students really down in a spiral. Um, it is not helping them from an educational perspective. And so, yes, let's get all of our students up to where they need to be on testing. This is not the way to do it. Um, is this teacher going to have standing? I feel like we've heard all these cases lately that the courts have dismissed because there's no standing. Does this teacher have standing? Yeah, we absolutely wouldn't have brought the case if we didn't think that she had standing. She's attended numerous mandatory trainings um, where they have racially segregated the teachers and she has been forced to teach this and to discriminate against her students. Um, you know, in having to implement the curriculum in her class, she is actually being forced to violate their civil rights. Mm. Okay, so would they say that she's been harmed? Uh, the harm here is the violation of the Equal Protection Clause. The Supreme Court has right. made that very clear, actually, in a, in a case that Southeastern Legal Foundation had back in the 90s, um, that when a, the government violates the Equal Protection Clause, that in and of itself is an injury. And we're litigating okay. this in a number of other areas and haven't had an issue with standing yet. Okay, wonderful. All right, my last question, similar to that, is, uh, is when this gets to the Supreme Court, uh, if it does, um, Will, do you think the court would view this very narrowly? Like, are they just gonna talk about this one school district? Or do you think this will have implications for the whole country? Well, what's interesting here is that District 65 has adopted a training for the teachers and a curriculum that is being used in many other schools across our country. Um, there are really, it's really a limited universe that's out there. And these schools pay a tremendous amount of money to bring these trainers in and bring these curriculum guides in. And so while it might seem narrow, it actually has really wide reaching implications because when you find that this particular uh, training program or curriculum violates the Equal Protection Clause, it's going to ripple throughout the country and affect yep. hundreds of other school districts. Uh, let's hope. I'm so grateful for you guys. Southeastern Legal Foundation. What's the timeline, Kimberly? Yeah, well, we just filed the complaint yesterday, so now we've got to wait for them to respond. And as any, as everyone knows, with court, it take it takes some time. Um, but we've got had overwhelming support for our client, and we are just really happy to see that. So we we appreciate yeah. the support. No, totally. please and please financially support the Southeastern Legal Foundation as they fight this. Uh, you are one of the flanks in our effort against CRT. So we're super grateful, Kimberly Herman, Southeastern Thank Legal Foundation. Thanks, Kimberly. Thanks. Have a wonderful day. Need to win this in every, we need to win it in the school boards, we need to win it in the classrooms, we need to win it in your home, we need to win it in the media, we need to win it in the courts. Grateful for them doing that. Uh, Florida, they banned teaching critical race theory in schools, but not every school is following that ban. We'll tell you a story of one school that's not coming up next. True story, Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Slater Crusader. So we just shared a story of a school district in Illinois, but it's every school district, but this one in particular, uh, finally taking it to the courts uh, against critical race theory. That's awesome. Now in Florida, uh, as our next guest is gonna explain, I thought there was a law banning critical race theory. And you've heard a couple of the states that where they say, oh, law banning it, but not quite exactly, which means we need to keep fighting. Brendan Leslie is here. He is the editor-in-chief of Florida's Conservative Voice, flconservativevoice.com. Brendan, how are you, brother? Good, Mike. How are you doing? Good, man. So I have heard, thought, that DeSantis banned critical race theory in schools. What happened? Yeah, so that's technically right. What he did was go to the Department of Education, and the Department of Education kind of runs the schools throughout the state, and he said, let's ban it. The board unanimously approved his request to ban critical race theory. But here's where it gets tricky. It's not an actual law. So they still need to go to the next legislative session and put together some kind of bill, pass it through the House and Senate, and then get it to the governor's desk for him to sign it. They didn't do that. And I know that um, there's some state reps that I've spoken to that said they're going to make that their priority in the next session. Uh, so what's happening now is technically it is banned. But if there's a school teaching critical race theory, a parent or a teacher or someone needs to take it up with the Department of Education, then there's a hearing. But that's a long process. That's like a year to maybe three years. So we really want to make this law so that it's quick and effective and you can snuff it out. Do you know of schools that are still teaching it because of that nuance? 
Oh yeah. Uh, so we got a big one here. Um, it's actually kind of a small store, a school, but it's a very unique story. And Babcock Ranch is a small uh, rural town that's actually been built recently off of renewable energy, kind of near Port uh, Charlotte County and Lee County here in Southwest Florida. And there's its principal, Shannon Treese, saying on social media she is committed to quote committed to teaching about white privilege and systemic racism, basically the the pillars of critical race theory. There's no, and, there's no way the people in, I think you, I'm sure you saw that video of that woman, crazy woman, walking in her house, throwing her purse on the ground and screaming at the camera because DeSantis yep, banned critical race theory. There's no way she's just going to be like, oh bummer, I guess I can't do it anymore. Like these people are going to fight to the end. They're not just going to stop, roll over. Well, what's interesting, what the Democrats always try to do, and this principal, Shannon Treese, that you're seeing on screen right now, is they lie and manipulate to the public. They say they're not teaching critical race theory. Go look at our curriculum. Find the words critical race theory. They do that on purpose because they know they're going to be tricking the masses. See, what critical race theory really is, is teaching inappropriate conversations with the students and, and teachers sharing their thoughts about white privilege and suppression and all this stuff that's really just myths. And it teaches the black kids that they're suppressed and that the white kids are suppressing them. So it's very, very subtle. It's not in your face. Mm -hmm. And that's what your viewers and everyone out there needs to understand, that the left is manipulating the narrative to trick the masses so that they can say that this is really a non-issue when it really is. The teachers need to teach the facts. They should be like what the mainstream media should be, but they're not. They should be teaching the facts, the history. Absolutely teach about slavery. It happened teach about it, but don't tell us your feelings about it and how it impacts uh, social issues nowadays. It's it's one of the, and listen, we needed to push back, but one of the bad parts about that is, as you said, they're gonna be more stealth about it. Here's one uh, teacher, she said, <clears throat> uh, we're teaching culturally responsive teaching, and this is my favorite one, cultural repertoires of practice. So they'd be like, oh no, no, we're not teaching critical race theory, we're teaching critical repertoires of practice. Just jargon nonsense to yep. try to get people to uh, be confused. Um, I'm glad you're fighting it. Glad you keep, you're keep you staying on this and exposing these schools that are doing it. I want to talk, I got two minutes left, so let's talk about DeSantis. Um, obviously, and this is the most obvious political point ever made, is that Donald Trump is going to be the worst person ever in the entire world until the next election, 2024, and Ron DeSantis is now going to be the next worst, because he's like a competent Donald Trump, is how they, right? He's a yep. Donald Trump who really believes it. Um, yep. Do you think he's going to be the nominee? It all depends on what President Trump wants to do. Everyone's waiting uh, to hear what his official announcement is going to be. Uh, both of them are alpha males. I do not see a reality where they run on the same ticket. I think it would be very stupid to have DeSantis be a vice president because that's kind of just taken our best offensive player off the board. The vice president is really just, to me, there. He just exists. He's not really a yeah. leader. So uh, if Trump does decide to win a run and becomes the nominee, you need, to keep, you need to keep DeSantis as the governor of Florida and then get him to run in 2028. But if Trump decides to, and which I think is the right move, he needs to be kind of like uh, the puppet master behind the scenes and put his mm. eggs into the DeSantis basket. And I think that can be really powerful. Uh, we got one minute. Is there any, I, I just, one reason I love DeSantis is he's on the offense. He's just pushing ahead nonstop. It's awesome. What's one thing in particular that DeSantis has done that you think is most notable? Maybe people outside Florida don't know it. Uh, I think the best thing about DeSantis is not necessarily the bills that he signed. It's the fact that this guy has zero scandal to him, no issues. He's exactly who he says he is. And that's why the left hates him. With Donald Trump, they were able to politicize his personal life, his celebrity career and all that. With DeSantis, he's just a stellar dude. Served in the military, uh, worked in local politics, and now he's gonna he's the governor and it's just nothing that they can attack him on. So that's gonna really hurt the Democrats when it comes to if he does decide to run for president. Awesome. Brendan Leslie, dude, let's definitely talk again. And obviously all Florida things go to flconservativevoice.com. Thanks, Brendan. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate it, Mike. Have a great day. Yeah, as we talked about DeSantis, he's all the good things about Trump and none of the bad things. Super excited for that 2024 race. True story. Mike Slater, see you tomorrow. Spread the word.